Morning, church. I'm going to read from John chapter 17, verse 24 to 26. Uh, It reads, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, Good morning, good morning, good morning, family. Uh, It's a lovely morning. Um, It's a privilege and it's an honor for me to be standing in front of you this morning as we conclude the series that we were on, which was titled Breathe. I thought of writing a poem about breathing, and then I figured if I write a poem about breathing, when I'm breathing, does that breathing make the breathing make sense? (laughs) So I said, let me not write anything for this week, uh, but maybe next time. Uh, we, We have been through several stages in this particular um, series. I am going to borrow from what uh, Reino said last week with regard to, he had titled it so far. And then he said, number one, we prayed, we learned about praying uh, to glorify the Son in verse one and two. Number two, about praying uh, for an experience of an eternal life in verse three. Uh, Praying for faithful, uh, praying to faithfully finish the work given to us in verse 4 and 5 of John 17, by the way, just in case you are wondering which you are seeing verse, verse, verse of what? Verse of John uh, 17. And then the reason for <coughs> uh, the prayer that is found in John 17, verse 6 and 11a, uh, praying for protection in verse 11b, to 16, praying for sanctification in verse 17 to 19. And last week we learned about um, praying that all believers could be one. And, and, and I am pretty chuffed and happy with the work that um, Reino has taken us through thus far. And this morning we are supposed to be a title, I think, Perfect in the Glory. Yeah, perfect. We are learning about, we're going to be learning about, supposed to be learning about. Yeah, I'm saying it's a post because I'm not sure whether you're going to go there. But let's see where it goes. Being perfected in the glory of Jesus Christ. Being perfected in the glory of Jesus Christ. A couple of weeks ago, let me, before I go there, start with this issue of breathing. And the reason why uh, the series started uh, and entitled Breathing. Breathing is one of the most important things in life that without it, you are not alive. If you cannot breathe, you are going to die. If you are not breathing, you are dead. So, <clears throat> Reno mentioned last week that one of the reasons why we went into this particular route of tackling it, breathing, and talking and looking at the prayer of Christ was that very same aspect of where do you get your life? You get your life from the master. You get your life from the maker. And you need to be in communion with the master and the maker in that particular aspect. So praying to God ought to be as natural as breathing. Praying to God and talking to God ought to come as natural as breathing. Sometimes, even when things are, going, are not going well in our lives, we never forget to breathe. Even when things are going well in our lives, we never forget to breathe. So the very same concept we need to apply also with our communication and our communion with God. That when things are going well in our lives, we never cease praying. Yeah. Even when things are not going well in our lives, we never cease praying. Prayer becomes a second nature. And you don't even have to think about, oh, by the way, now it's time to pray. It needs to be something that constantly happens. Something that happens without even you understanding or being aware that this is what is happening currently. This is what we employ you. And if anything, from this particular series, we just need to remind you that let us cultivate that spirit of prayer, that culture of prayer, that moment of saying, even when you are doing whatever you're doing, still God remains at the forefront of your thinking, the forefront of your thoughts, the forefront of your being remains the crux, 
their own. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we were in a particular series and we had Sitley come around and he was preaching and he was preaching about the resurrection of Christ. And he was saying that if the resurrection of Christ did not happen, then Christ is not who we believe him to be. Because it would be just like he is a motivational speaker who was able to motivate people into, into doing good. And then he died and that's the end of it. But the resurrection of Christ brought something else. That even death could not hold him down. Even death couldn't keep him down. He was risen. He has risen. He is alive. Did he, not, he did not only just die on the cross, but he is alive. Now this morning we are looking at praying that we may be perfected in the glory of the Son. We'll most, mostly look at, the, at what prompted and inspired Christ uh, to not only pray for those who were with him, but also for those who will believe through those who were with him. And that is you and I. It is a privilege to know that Christ prayed for me. That when Christ was communicating with the Father when he was on earth, he had me in mind. He had me in mind. He had you in mind. He prayed for you. Because if you look at the prayer itself from verse 1 to verse 26, you will see that he's not only praying for those that were with him at that particular point in time. You will see that he's only, also praying for those that were not there, those that would believe through those that believed at that particular point in time. And that includes you and I. He prayed for you. And he still prays for you. He is interceding in heaven on our behalf at this point in time. He says in verse 24 of John 17, Father, I want those that you have given me to be with me where I am and to see, my glo to see the glory that you have given to me because you loved me, because, of, or because you loved me before the creation of the world. Now, you may be sitting there wondering, what is this guy doing just, you know, just continuous, continuously, talking before, uh, continuously talking about prayer and he hasn't even prayed, right? So let's pray. <clears throat> uh, dear Heavenly Father, you are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the beginning and the end. All things that we do are done for you, through you. Without you, O oh Father God, nothing and none of this makes sense. So this morning, O oh Father God, we come before your throne and I bring your children before you, O oh Father God, as I come with them, O oh Lord. To say, Lord of all creation, speak to our hearts, O oh Father. May it be you, O oh Father God, that speaks to our spirit, O oh Father God. That even if there are words, O oh Father God, that proceeds not from my mouth, O oh Father God, that you continue, O oh Father God, to stir up in our hearts, the passion and the love for your name, O oh Father God, and for your glory, O oh Lord. I pray, O oh Father God, that may it be you, O oh Father God, that speaks to your children. That when pride, O oh Father God, wants to creep up, O oh Father God, that you be the one that takes control. Not of all creation, that in every single thing that we do, we do for you, because of you, and in you. Not of all creation, we surrender this session to you, we surrender this this message to you, O oh Father God, that we may get to know you better, O oh Lord of all creation, that we may understand you better, O oh Jesus Christ. So this we pray in the name of our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Now, we just read now what Christ said in his prayer, talking to his Father. He's saying, Father, I want those that you have given to me to be with me where I am, and to see my glory, to see my glory, to see Christ's glory. Now, I try to have a look at the definition of glory so that I can, it can make sense as to what exactly is it that he's talking about. And this is what the Oxford Dictionary says, uh, on Google, by the way. This is how he defines glory. High renown or honor won by notable achievements. Magnificence. Number two, it says magnificence or great beauty. Now that number one talks about for you to achieve a certain part of glory, there's certain achievements, notable achievements 
that you ought to have received. But you see, Christ here is talking about the glory that he has already, he already had prior to doing anything. The glory that God had given to him. That is what he's talking about here. Not something that... So, so what, what I'm saying is, these definitions, and whatever definitions you can come across that somebody has written down, pales in comparison to the glory that Christ is talking about. And he wants us to be able to, to see him reveling in his glory. To see him in his full glory. And that is the invitation that is open to you and I. The invitation that is open to you and I. To see him in his glory. To see, and, and, and there's something else also that I think we should, we should, we should, we should, we should, we should um, clarify. He's not saying to partake in my glory. He's saying to see me in my glory. The glory that you have given me the creation, before the creation of the world. You know, I don't know if you, you, you guys are, I was looking for pictures of uh, Chelsea Football Club in his glory, and I couldn't find any. <laughs> so, this is what I could find. There's a picture. Look at this. Look at these people. They are marveling in glory. There is the, from the Euro 2020, when England, I think it was England who won, who won the Euro 2020. Yeah, I think these people are marveling in the glory of the wind, right? But here is the thing. They are feeling as if they are the ones who won, but they were not in the playing field. They were not playing, right? But they are seeing it. They are feeling it. They are embracing it. They are being proud. They are proud, rather, of the nation that won that particular cup. And they feel that this is the glory that we can partake in. This is the glory that we can partake in because our people did this. Look at the excitement on their faces. They were not necessarily partakers of the glory. They were not the ones who achieved or obtained the glory, but they can partake in it, and they can be joyous in that particular glory. And this is the glory that Christ is talking about, that this is my glory. I want you to come and feel what I am feeling, what God has given us to you. This is the glory that we are being called to. In fact, this one even pales, to be honest compared to the glory that we are being called to. The glory that Christ is calling us to. When the Springbok won the World Cup, I wanted to bring that particular picture, and I was like, nah, but uh, Reno has used this picture two weeks in a row, me using it for the third time. You know, where, where, where Sia Collins is holding the, the, the Kalis, what do they call it? Web Kalis. Web Alice, yes. Web Alice Cup. You, that, that moment that he won, Every South African felt it, that no, we, we have made it, we have achieved it. But they were not playing, by the way. But they can participate in the joy. They can, they, they can marvel in the joy of the victory. And this is the victory that Christ has. He has won the victory over death, over sin. And we can rejoice in it because our Father has given us that, is giving us that glory. Our Father is allowing us to share in that glory of victory. That glory of victory. The perfect glory of victory. We will be perfected in that glory if we are with him. If we are with him. A couple of weeks ago, I, I took my boys to their first ever big professional rugby, rugby, rugby game. When the Bulls were playing, I think they were playing uh, some Irish club, which they beat, by the way. And 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 I could see the joy in their in, in, in their eyes. And Moloko even said to me that, you know, next time we, every time we go to rugby, we must come here, because he was in the field of dreams that is loved us, by the way. Just in case you don't know, you know, he saw it was full. And and when everybody was doing the Mexican waves. They joined in. They had fun. And when the Bulls won and everybody was celebrating, they celebrated, even though they don't understand which team won. But they celebrated. They shared in the glory of the Bulls' victory. And now, imagine the victory and the glory that we can share by being in Christ and with Christ. That is the glory that we have been called to. 
they have to be there to experience it. He has experienced it before, hence he says. He has experienced it before. And he wants us to look forward to seeing him in the fullness of his glory. And have you ever been in that situation or, or been in that position where there, there's somebody that you're rooting for? They are running and you're rooting for them or they're doing whatever they're doing and you're rooting for them and they get the medal. That joy, that, 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 that oomph, that thing that stirs within you and just wants you to just jump up and say, yes, yes, we made it. Even though you were not necessarily participating. But the joy, the joy of being part of that glory, of that celebration. Imagine when we reach heaven and we see Christ in his glory. Imagine seeing him, feeling him, him, his glory covering you. And his glory would not just be the issue of saying, oh, but I wasn't there when he went to the cross. But his glory would go deep down in each and every cell of your being, every fiber of your being. You will feel his glory. You will feel the impact of who he is. That is the glory that we have been called to, that he is praying for us to, 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 to partake in. There's a saying that stick with me and you'll learn a thing or two. Now stick with Jesus and you will feel his glory. Stick with Jesus and you will feel his glory. It was, it was love that propelled Christ to glory. It was love that led to God giving his one and only begotten son that whoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life and feel that particular glory. Now in chapter, in verse 25, in the prayer, Christ continues to say, Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you. And they know you have sent me. I have made you known to them. And I will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them them. Now, the question that comes to one's mind when I read what Christ is saying, when I read what Christ is saying, that though the world does not know you, I know you and they know you. Now, the question that I have for all of us is, do you know this God? Do you know this Christ? And how do you know him? When did you get to meet him? To know him. When did you get to when did you get to know him? Who is he to you? How do you know him? Where have you experienced him? Was it when you were sick and he was your healer that you became to really know of him or to know him? Was it when you were lost and he endlessly pursued you and left the ninety nine just for you? Was that when you got to know him? How do you know this God? Was it when you had no strength or will to carry on and you just found yourself the next day and the next day and still you are here carrying on? Has that experience showed you who he was and you got to know him? How do you know this God? Do you know this God? When have you experienced this God? These are the questions that only you can answer because only you have a relationship with him. But think about it. Christ says, the world does not know you, God. But I've made you known to them. Have you known God? Do you know God? And how do you no God. Was it when you were on the verge of suicide and had lost all hope that he came through for you and you got to know him? Or was it when that beautiful lady walked into your life or that handsome 
guy walked into your life and you realize that I'm uh, looking at myself, definitely I cannot, this cannot be me. This must have been God. Was it at that stage that you, you understood who God was, that you got to know God? In fact, let me ask this question, let me ask it this way. How is your relationship with God? The one that you were just thinking about, how you know him. How is your relationship with him? How often do you talk to him? How often do you commune with him? How often do you let everything else go and concentrate only and solely on him? Do you know this God? And if you do, how is your relationship with him? How is your relationship with him? In actual fact, let's bring it a bit home. How is your relationship with those around you? When they look at you, do they see and do they experience God through you? Do they know of God through you? Do they know that indeed, because of the way that this person behaves, because of the way that this person carries themselves, there must be a God that they have a relationship with? Is our lives, are our lives a testimony of who God is? The other day, I was taking my boys to sleep, and out of nowhere, uh, Mulago asks me, Dad, what, what, is your, what is your role in this family? <laughs> I wasn't expecting that question, and it was just a, a, an answer that I had to give, but I, and I gave it then. And I, I continued thinking about it, and, and my answer to him was, my role is to make sure that you have a better life than I ever had. Right? And, and, and you can look at there and say, well, that's a very lame, lame answer. I, well, that is what came to my mind at that particular point in time. I hadn't had time to think about it. And, you know, but I, I told him that, that my role is to make sure that you have a better life than I ever had. And, and now I'm looking at it, that my response to him was, my role is to put your best interest at heart, your best interest before mine. That is my role in this family. And the very same thing, imagine if me as an individual, a fallible human being, can think of it that way. How about the father who gave his only son for us to die on the cross? How much more does he care about you and I? How much more does he want you? Does he have your best interest at heart? Even when things are not seemingly going according to plan. But if I, as a fallible human being, can have such best interest as a heart for my boys, how about our God? How about my Father? Who is not fallible? How about Him? Now the question, I've been saying the question, I've been asking too many questions, right? <laughs> I'm just hoping, though, that uh, these this questions stir something in your heart uh, that you go to the Father and commune with him, and he can help you answer them for yourself. There, there, there will be a number of uh, scripture references uh, that, will, um, that may or may not be, no, they're definitely not on the, on the, on the, on the projector. What moves you as a Christian? Why are you here this morning? And what makes you tick? What, what moves you as, as, a, as a Christian? What is it that, that propels you? I mean, there are people right now, as you're speaking, who are busy with whatever they're busy with. But you chose to come and be here. Or what moved you? And when you came in and to, to be here, uh, you found chairs stacked. You found everything stacked. You found coffee made. What do you think moves these people who did and prepared this venue to be the way it was when you got here? What moves you as a Christian? 
I shut out a response to say that it is love. I say that I do what I do for who I do, for those that I do for because of love. And I continue to also say that I believe that the backbone of Christ's message was love. That everything he did, he did for love. That every person he healed, he healed because he loved them. That every message he preached, he preached because he loved, even when he was retributing. Is it retributing, right? Correcting. That is, yeah, no, retribution is revenge. So, so when, when, when he was rebuking, it was out of love. Everything that Christ did was out of love. How is your love for Christ? How is your love for those around you? There's a reason why we ask the question of the day the way, the day, the way that, that we did. Not how do you want to receive love, but it was about you giving the love. Because you have received the love already from Christ. How then do you, do you pass on that love? How do you show the people that you love, that you love them? How do we show them that we love them? A couple of weeks ago, Reno came here and gave a financial, uh, financial report. And in that he mentioned that uh, this church of all the funds that he has, it has received, 51% of it went away, gave it away to the people within the church who were struggling, to people outside the church who needed, who needed it. The, 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 the finances that were received were not hoarded. And, 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 and one could ask, why would you do that? I mean, many people will receive the money and just keep it for themselves. But we believe in being a horse pipe. It doesn't keep water. It is there for the water to flow through. That is propelled by love pushed by love, encouraged by love, to show the love of the Father to the love or to, 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 to the people around us. The Bible says that how can you say that you love God that you haven't seen, yet the people around you, you are struggling to love them, show them love and care. How, how, how is that? Can you truly say that you love God when you cannot love somebody around you? There, there must be another thing here. This is what Jesus said about love. When asked, what is the greatest commandment in Mark 12? One of the teachers of the law came, to, came and had them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked him, of all the commandments, which one is important? Which is the most important? Jesus uh, replied, the most important one is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul and your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. There is no commandment greater than this. Christ did what he did because he understood the love of God and continues to encourage us to do what he did, be, being propelled, being pushed, being fanned by love. Being fanned by love. Now, we come to church and we hug each other, we, we talk to one another and we we show love to one another, but what happens after the service? To somebody that you haven't spoken to, to somebody that doesn't look like you, to somebody that looks dirty, and, and do you show the same love that you have shown to somebody that looks like you in the church? If we are Christians, so what is it that pushes us? And if we are saying we have the love of God in our hearts, 
but still you're not showing that same love to those that are around us, to strangers around us? Can we truly say that we love God? Can we truly say that we love God? When I am failing to love the people that are closest to me, when I am failing to care for the people that are around me, can I truly say that I love God? Can I truly say that the love of God is within me? What pushes me as a Christian? If it is love that pushes you to do what you do, are you sharing it? Are those people that are around you seeing that particular love? Even when you are angry with somebody that you love and you speak, are you speaking? Is your speech covered in love? Even when you are not feeling so good, is your speech covered in love? I am tempted to... This morning, uh, uh, as, as, as we were... As I was preparing to come, uh, my girlfriend was busy sleeping and I took my, the clothes out that I wanted to, to wear. And, and, and she says, no, you cannot wear that. Right? And I'm like, what's wrong? She said, no, you cannot wear that. And, and she gave her reasons. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, when I was here and I was thinking about it, thinking back, I'm like, hmm. Maybe she had a point, and I think my response would have been different had she approached it differently. So I, I'm just saying that there will be times where the people that you love make you angry. There will be times that the people that you love say things that you don't agree with. How are you going to respond? Is your response going to be covered in love? Or are you going to forget that you are a Christian when you are angry? And remember that you are a Christian when you are not angry? Are you going to remember the love of God only when things are going well? And showing the love of God when only things are going well in your life? Does it mean when I'm going through trials and tribulation, then I am excused from showing love? No. God has showed us love. Remember, even this chapter 17, if you go to chapter 18 of John, immediately after he had prayed, they walked to the mountain and Christ was arrested and he suffered. He suffered. And he hung on the cross. And as he hung on the cross, he said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they are doing. Propelled by love. Even in the midst of pain, even in the midst of discomfort, let the love of God never disappear from you. Even when things, even when you are very angry and you are shaking in anger because people before you, in front of you, who are supposed to be people of integrity are not people of integrity, still don't let the love of God disappear from you. Communicate still in love. Even though you feel sometimes that I'm being taken advantage, still that is not an excuse to stop loving. That is not an excuse to stop loving. In fact, there is never an excuse for anyone to stop loving. I mean, Christ even said, love your enemies. There is no excuse for not loving. There is no excuse for not loving. Jesus has always been all about love. Jesus is and will always be all about love. There are a number of scriptures, let me just quote them for you, that talks about the command that we have for love. In John 15, 13, it says, My command is this, love one another as I have loved you. Verse 13, greater love has no one than this, to lay one's life for a friend. You find this in the Bible. In 1 John 4, 16. And so we know and rely on the love of God. And so we know 
and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. 1 John 4.19 We love because he loved us first. And his love was never conditional on being treated fairly. His love was never conditional on being treated right. He loved before we were even born. Knowing what we were going to do, still he chose to love us. And this is the question for us. As we look at the prayer of Christ and we see that he was propelled by love for his people, Christ was encouraged by love for his people and he prayed for all of us. Now the question comes to us, what are we doing with that love? Are we passing it on? Are we keeping it to ourselves? Are we holding it? May, 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 may we be like an ocean, vast in love, spreading it around. Be like the rain falls on anyone, even the evil one. When the rain falls, it doesn't say, no, you have been evil, so I'm not going to fall into your house. It falls to everyone. Let us show the love of God in that same precept. That we are going to show the love of God to everyone, whether they deserve it or they don't deserve it. Ours is to love you. Ours is not to judge who deserves to be loved. Ours is to propel the love of God. If you look at Ephesians 4, verse 2, it says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. 1 Corinthians 13, in actual fact, let's just go to 1 Corinthians 13, that is the scripture that talks mostly about love. First Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or clinging symbol. If I have the gifts of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge. And if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all that I possess to the poor and give over my body for hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. I gain nothing. Gain nothing. It's supposed to be love that propels us, brethren. It's supposed to be love that compels us to show Christ to the world. The love is supposed to be the one that illuminates his presence in our lives. First John 4:12. Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. This is not Luke, the Bible saying. If you hate your brother or sister and profess to love God, you are a liar. For whoever does not love their brothers and sisters, whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. Now it goes back to this that I ask. In conclusion, how do you know God? When did you get to know God? And how do you know him? And if you look at your life and the things that you do and the way that you've been living your lives, have you been showing God to those around you, to those that you come across? Can they say that they know God through you? Can they say that they have experienced God through you, God's love through you? This is a question that we need to think about, ponder about. How do we know God? What propels us? We've just prayed the prayer of Christ. For the past four to five weeks, we have looked at the words that Christ prayed for you and I, spoke to God. And our desire is that you are moved into prayer, fueled, pushed, funneled, urged by the love of God. 
that you speak to God, that you, you revive that communication that you once had with him. You get to know him better and then get to live the love of God, that everyone around you will experience the love of God through you. That you are a willing vessel to be used to show the love of God. That is my prayer. And Heavenly Father, as we conclude, O oh Father God, this session, I continue to pray, O oh Father God, still that you propel your children, O oh Father God, into fellowship with you. And that, O oh Father God, they may continue, O oh Lord of all creation, to show the love that you have for them and for us all, to everyone around us. That even in times, O oh Father God, where we feel unjustly treated, still we never cease to love. We never cease to show the love that, that you have shown to us and lead by the example, O oh Father God, that you have shown to us. O oh, Father God, we pray that may communicating with you, may, may communing with you, O oh, Father God, be second nature, be like breathing, O oh, Father God, unto you. May us talking to you, O oh, Father God, be like us breathing, O oh, Father God. And us loving those that are around us, O oh, Father God, may be like us breathing, O oh, Father God. We pray this in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.